All right, hey folks. In this video, we're gonna be continuing talking about access control and specifically, we're gonna dig into how do we model access control? Um, and so you may, before you get super scared, this is gonna be very quick and it's gonna be a little more high level and theoretical, but the point is, what we wanna do is, is how do we think about access control and how do we be able to model that specifically so that we can reason about, hey, is our system secure? Does our system properly implement that authorization policy that we have in the access control mechanism itself? So specifically, we're gonna get into how to model access control. There's gonna be some you know, mathematical symbols. I swear, it's not crazy. All we're talking about is like sets and, and just things. And this is gonna be very generic so that we can A, understand how access control works, how to think about access controls. And then as we get into in the next video, we're gonna be looking at how do systems actually implement that. And of course, we're interested in A, how systems implement it, so B, we can attack it. So, okay, so we when we think about access control, we have subjects. Uh, so we'll use S here to represent subjects. S is the set of subjects in the system. Basically, in access control terms, it's things in the system that can act. So it depends on, again, and this is when we were talking about modeling, we have to model a specific access control system. So it may not, it's uh, what a subject is depends on the specific system that we're talking about, but things in the system that can actually take actions. Um, so when you, uh, it will actually get into the details of how like the Unix access control model works, which is used in Linux and, and Mac OS and actually a lot of places. And so things in the system that can act in those case would be a process is something that can do an action that can try to read or write to a file. Um, in different models, you'll have different things that are considered subjects. Uh, in the Unix access control model, a subject would not be a file because a file by itself can't do anything. Um, and you may be thinking, but hey, Adam, a process actually is a file on the file system, but uh, you have to actually be able to execute a file on the system, which is a process that creates a new process. So subjects can be created. Uh, but for now we think about, okay, just subjects, things in the system that can do actions. And we also have a set O of objects, and these are assets or objects in the system that subjects can act on. And this makes sense. If you think about, hey, we have subjects, we have things that we can act. Well, what, what are they doing these actions on? What are these actions? Um, and so, now, of course, the next thing would be, well, what are these actions? What actions can subjects take? And that's where we get to the set R of the rights in the access control model. So what can the subjects do to the objects? And this is the set that describes that. So if you describe all of this, you can say, hey, these are all the subjects in my system. These are all the objects. These are all the rights. Quick check for you, how many, when you're thinking about this, are are these sets distinct? Meaning there's a complete, uh, like is S, so if you took the union between S and zero, and not zero, uh, S and O, is that the empty set? If you took the union, or not the not the union, the intersection, so the uppercase N. So if you saw what's in common, I'm trying to do like Venn diagrams with my hands. Maybe you can see that if you're watching the video. Uh, so if you can think of the what's in common between S and objects, what's in common between O and R or S and R, and I think that's all the combinations. Um, and so it, again, depends on the system. Sometimes you can have subjects that are not objects, so you can't actually act on the subjects. Sometimes you can. Sometimes subjects can have rights on different subjects. So if you think about um, the Unix model, if you have a process, a process can send a signal to another process, and so that would be a right. So that'd be something that can be acted upon is both so objects in that case would be both objects and subjects. But again, it depends on your system. So there can be overlaps in subjects and objects. I think it'd be very unlikely to have overlaps in rights with subjects and objects because the rights are kind of what actions can you take. And think of here's things like reading a file, writing to a file, these types of different actions. So it kind of makes sense that those would be separate from subjects and objects. And this is just all ways to help you kind of conceptualize and think about these different um, aspects of the access control model. And the next question is, okay, so if we have this model, so we have this sets of subjects, sets of objects, rights, how do we know which, like what the model access control system actually allows? So if we said, hey, 
can a certain subject have this certain right on this object? And one of the easiest ways to do this is with a matrix, or you can think about a bit giant table. Um, and on the table, we'll have the, uh, the rows are each of the objects. So here we have U and V are objects in our system. Uh, sorry, no, that's not right. Uh, columns. So the columns are the objects. So F, G, U, and V are all of our objects. And U and V are the subjects in the system. So here in the system, we have U and V as subjects. And then we have the objects F, G, U, and V. Um, and so the way we use this model is actually very easy. We say, okay, we can answer questions like, and we have here we have just some very basic abstracted rights. So R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. So we could say, hey, does subject U have the right R4 on object F? And we can very easily answer that question by looking at the subject. So the subject U here. So we look at the row U, and then we look at the column F, and we'd say, is there R6 in that, or whatever I said, I actually can't remember, or R5 or R4 in that set? The answer is no. And if we want to ask the questions, what rights does subject V have on object F? We could see, okay, V has rights two and right three to F. Um, and so this is the way that we can then model a system and we can see, th ask questions like, hey, does, uh, if G is a file I'm trying to protect and my authorization policy says only subject U should have R2 to, to G, uh, write R2 to G, well, I can look at G and I can see, uh, I can actually just look at this whole column and see, does anybody else have R2 except for U? The answer is no. And so great, this actually does, uh, I can kind of prove in this way the policy. Now, the tricky thing here is this actually is all contained in a, um, this is a static snapshot of the current access control system. And as we actually talked about uh, a little bit with the Unix model, when you execute a program, so if you have the right to execute a program, which is a file that creates a new process, which is a new object. So acting on that, right. So you can think about the sequence of access control actions would be talking about how the access control model changes, depending on what action actions are taken by what subjects. And so the, the why we're doing this modeling and why people get into this is to be able to an, answer the question of hey so we asked the question hey if the snapshot in time does any other subject besides you have r2 rights to uh object g and we can say no here but the question is what kind of actions in the system can the system ever get into a state where uh, subject u where another subject except for you has rights R2 to G. And that would depend on what these rights actually do and the semantics of the system. So we can't answer that question with this model. But this is why we do these kind of formal modelings. And this is why it's important for you to be thinking in your mind when you're trying to access a system and you can say, oh, hmm, I don't have the rights to read that file, but I can execute another program and that program has access to read the file. So can I trick that file into reading that file for me and giving its contents, right? That's where we get down to merging this theory that we're talking about up here with what you actually do when you're trying to attack systems. And this is precisely why we do this to help you think about how to attack these systems. So this is a generic model. We're going to a, a simplified Unix model where we'll get later into the actual Unix model. So here in the model, uh, subjects are processes. So this is actually something that maybe surprises you if you're using a Linux system. You, you might think, well, I'm a user. I take actions, therefore I am the subject. But to the system, you don't actually exist. You're not a user that the system actually cares about. What the system cares about is a process. And actually, as we get into it, we'll see that each process has a unique user ID and that user ID has rights on objects. Uh, so in this case, in our simplified model, we'll have P and Q as our sub uh, as our processes. So these are just subjects that exist and files are objects. So in this case, just F and G, and we won't consider a process as an object in this case. So there's no overlap between subjects and objects in this model. Um, and then we'll have the writes. So we'll have the right read, write, execute, append, and own. So first thing when thinking about this is, 
okay, what do these actually mean? And this is important, right? Because we talked about when you want to try to analyze the security of the system, you need to understand the semantics of what each of these rights allows a subject to do so that you can reason in your head, oh, if I do this, then this thing can happen. So for instance, in this model, we'll define, we can read a file being, hey, this file, the contents of this file can be read by this process if it has the right, or sorry, the read right. The read writes, uh, R, R writes, the read write. Okay, a process can change the contents of a file and write to the file if it has the right writes. Okay, and third one, a uh, an object, a, f a process can execute an file if it has the execute privilege. And we talked about what does this actually do? This creates a new process in the system. So a new row will be added to the matrix and that new process would then have to have writes on some other files. And we'll get into exactly how that happens in the real Unix model later. Append. So append is maybe weird. We usually kind of, uh, you know, thinking about English words, append means add to the end. But when you're writing a file, you can also be appending to the end. So what's the key semantic distinction here? And that's specifically why I'm going through and defining all of these rights. So with the right, right, I can change the contents of the file, including deleting the entire contents of the file and writing a new content to the file. Whereas with the append right, I can only add to the file. I can never change what happened before it. Um, so think about when would that be useful? When would it be useful or why would it be useful to have a model where you can append to a file, but not actually write and change the contents of that file? And maybe some things that we were talking about actually in the previous video may come to mind, where you'd want to be able to append to a log of actions of what happened. And this way, if your process that is writing to the log file gets compromised, it cannot, it can alter and change future log entries, but it can't go back and alter and change the log contents uh, itself. So this is why having a, a write like append being different than a write like write helps you do things like reduce risk in your system because you can give the appropriate writes that um, a process needs. And finally, the own. So this is a, a, um, a write and an own ownership right in a Unix model means that you as an owner can then, if I own a file or an object in this case, I can then give rights to other processes for that object. Um, and so this is how you can actually modify and change that matrix model. So let's go look at it and we'll, we will um, abbreviate these rights by just the letters R, W, X. So read, write, execute, append, and own. Um, and then we can Given a, a system, we can actually understand and look at every, so every row will have the, as we talked about, the subjects, and every column will have the objects. And here, I guess our subjects are uh, also with our objects. So we have P and Q as columns in our objects. And we can see that P has read, write, and own on F, read on G, read, write, execute, own on P, and just write to Q. Q has append only on F, read, own on G, read on P, read, write, execute, and own on Q. So we can look at this model and we can say, answer questions like, hey, is it possible for Q, so right now Q can only append to F, but is it possible for Q to read the file F? Let's say F is some super secret important file. Um, and the other thing about append only access is you can't read the contents that came before you. You can only add new content. So by appending, that doesn't tell you what previously existed in the file. So right now, Q cannot read file F at all. And what this model allows us to do in thinking through how can P get to the, how can the system get to that point? Because we want to say, hey, is that ever possible? Well, with this ownership model, if I if P owns file F, then that means P can give privileges uh, rights to that file to other processes. So in this case, Q uh, P can use the ownership right on F in order to give read access to F, in which case the model would, and I will just go change it like this, the model can then be changed. And now by doing that, using the owner action on the file F, 
Now Q has read access to that file. And now, yes, the system can get into this bad state. Um, so this is, again, really important when thinking about what are all the actions on the system and how can data maybe flow from one thing to the other, or how can I modify and change the access control uh, matrix itself? And this is, again, not, this is not something that you will necessarily just sit down and write this whole matrix model uh, when you're trying to attack a system, but thinking through this is actually really important to securing systems. Um, and one of the benefits of having this matrix model is you have, you can look at literally every, the entire system at any point in time and know exactly who has rights to what things. But it may be worth thinking about what are the drawbacks? Well, looking at this model, think about a system that you use now. So even just the Pwn College system that you have access to, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of files on that system. And that would mean you're operating system, which is ultimately who's going to enforce this access control policy, uh, sorry, this access control matrix, that this uh, matrix would have columns for every single file on the system, which could be 10,000 columns. And then every time a process is created, you may have hundreds of processes on your system, there'll be a new row. And so managing this access control model in this matrix um, can be a real big uh, downside. And so you know, think about, and when you're watching this video, think about other maybe benefits and drawbacks. There's some kind of clear ones that I didn't really talk about, but, uh, think about, uh, think about that when you're, um, and maybe write in the comments or something about what you think as like other benefits and drawbacks. Maybe we can use that in lieu of a discussion, uh, which what I would usually have in class at this point. So this is how we can model the access control of a system and then reason about how the access control can change when subjects take actions on the system. And so again, important to understand that because conceptually this is what you do as an attacker. You're just not doing it as formally. You're building up that model in your mind and you're thinking through all the possibilities of things that you as an attacker can do and how that will influence the access control of the system.